The Radio Forest Podcast. Uh, hi, this is Veer Das. How are you? Veer Das, the Pateller Feller. <laughs> How goes? How's your knees? Um, much better. I'm just, uh, I'm 43. That's what it is. That's all that is. 45, I understand. I actually had some um, some issues where I thought it was my patellar. It ended up being something else, but I know too well the pain of that. Are you doing rehab? That's got to be a struggle on the road. I just got done with some rehab. So I have a physical therapist who's coming in and sort of uh, making other parts of my body hurt. And then this doesn't seem that hurtful. We're talking to Indian comedian Veer Das. He's coming to Boise, Idaho, October 13th, doing his Wanted show. Veer, why go to Boise, Idaho, where you've got to win over new people? You're a very big comic. You've got a ton of success in other countries. You could stay in those countries and continue to grow those crowds. I mean, you've played in front of 2,000 people, 5,000 people, more than that. Why step out of your comfort zone and do a town like Boise where they're like, who is this guy? Uh, That really is the sentiment where they are like, (laughs) who is this guy? And I'm like, you know, I haven't had to worry about people knowing who I am uh, for a while, so that's nice to go through, and it's humbling, and it's good to build a new crowd. But also, I wouldn't worry too much about the Indian audience. It's not like I'm neglecting them. We have 1.3 billion people. that We're expanding as we speak. So it's a growing machine. So I think I can do both at the same time. I can build Boise while India builds itself. Now, Mumbai and Bombay, that's one of the biggest cities in the world. And in my yes. impression... Like a town of like Boise is, is very different than, say, even like Denver. But if you get to like New York, London, L.A., I feel like like New York's got more of that city feel. I even say like Chicago to me feels bigger than London. But with your experience and your travel, when you get a city the size of Bombay, how does that differ from like a New York? That's a whole nother level of city or is a certain size just a big city? No, I think, you know, uh, what I always say is New York and Bombay are just exactly the same, except in New York, the criminals have Twitter following. Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, we're the only two people in the world where a guy could run in and like threaten to kill everyone. And we'd be like, you know, he had more energy last week. <laughs> uh, they're similar vibes. And what I love about both cities is whoever you hate lives right next to you. <laughs> you know, and so it teaches you tolerance in both of these cities. So I, I think it makes you a more loving person. I, New Yorkers like to posture, like they're really tough and aggressive, but I think they're pretty big-hearted people, and Mumbaikers are the same. What would it be like, guys? I imagine a place like New York, you can fit in very well, your English is fine, there's all types of different people, but with like a guy like me, like a six-foot white guy that can't speak anything else, how bad would I stand out in India? I mean, I'd probably be... No, you wouldn't. Really? I mean, look, you'd pay Blend 900% right for everything. We'd overcharge you for everything. <laughs> That's about the meanest thing that we would do to you. Uh, but I think you'd fit right at home, especially in Bombay. Bombay is full of expats and people from all over the world. You'd have a really good time. Now, let's talk a little bit more about your country, Johnny Lever. Do you ever get a chance to meet him? Yeah, yeah, I've worked with him. I've done two movies with him and a bunch of comedy festivals with him as well. He's amazing. He's the number one guy. You're both comedians, both from India. You're both Bollywood stars. But would it be safe to say that you might be bigger than him now? That's got to be surreal because he didn't have YouTube. You've broken into the U.S. You've got global exposure that he couldn't get at that time. No, I, I think that, you know, he definitely, if Johnny Lever walks down the street in Mumbai or in the smallest town in India, everybody knows who he is. And not just that, is happy to see him and wants to sing and dance and give him a hug. I don't have that yet. You know, I'm still an English comic at the end of the day. So while I might have large global numbers, I don't think I'll ever have the connection with people that Johnny Lever has. He has a connection with 1.3 billion people. That's not something to be underestimated. You know, it's gigantic. Have you picked up anything then how to connect to that Indian crowd? Because you you point out an interesting part that he has captivated his Indian audience in a way that you haven't yet, or maybe it's not Mm -hmm. in your tool set. So what have you picked up from him about, like, how do I get an Indian crowd to love Veer Das? Uh, well, I just sleep with my audiences at the end of the show. That's really good word of mouth. <laughs> you got a lot of people, though. I know. That's why I'm coming to Boise. I can sleep with less people. <laughs> it's like an easier night. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think for me, the one rule I always have is they should know you the second you tell your first joke. And you should leave yourself with them. So, like, any comedian can make you laugh for about an hour if they're good and they're worth their salt. But can they take you in their, into their heart and can you feel like you know this person because you came to their show? I think that's the mark of a great musician, no comedian or performer. So that's what I aim to do. And that's something I got from Johnny Lever. Everybody knows him and that's why they love him. He puts himself out there. Now, what about Jon Stewart? I know you started a show kind of based off the framework that he had. 
for, you know, talking about politics yes. and current news events. Did you ever have a chance to meet him and, and tell him how he inspired you? No, I, I would love to. I, I just, you know, I, I don't spend enough time in the States. And then by the time I started doing so, he had retired already. But he was a gigantic influence. And I was doing a version of him just way too early. I was 25 without any of his you know, wisdom or experience, even when he took over the Daily Show. So it was really just kind of a very bad imitation, which I don't know if I'd want him to see. If I'm being <laughs> when you're doing all this traveling, like you said, you haven't been to the States as much to meet him yet. So you've done a ton of traveling. And when you do those long flights, I didn't fly for a little bit with COVID and then I've kind of gotten back into it. And I forgot I had like a routine. I'm like, I got to have my headphones, but I got to have earbuds I got to have cables for my iPhone and for my tablet. I got to have a plug depending on what seat I'm in. Now, I imagine you're probably flying business or maybe first class, but I have a checklist of like, I got to have these things in my bag that I can grab, not in the overhead, because once I sit down, I want to be set. So when you're doing a long flight, India to mm -hmm. America, what do you have to have? What does Veer have to have? What's the one thing, well, if you okay. forget, you're like, this flight sucks? It's much less chilled out than you. So I have to have a visa, then I have to have a hotel confirmation, <laughs> then I have to have proof that I own property in India, then I have to have proof that I have savings enough in the funds in India, that I will go back once I've come to America so that I can convince immigration that I'm not going to just stay and never leave. So that's kind of my checklist. And then I have to dress really well when I fly. You know, I'm, I'm a brown man with a beard, so I have to dress like I'm buying the airline. You know, just so that everybody feels good about letting me into their various countries. I went to 29 countries this year, and I think I have it down to a science. Like, I managed to do 29 countries this year without check-in luggage, which is uh, an achievement I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm pretty proud of. You know, just two carry-ons. That's a huge difference when you fly, if not waiting for that luggage. But you mentioned a great point. You know, I'm talking about these state-to-state -state flights, having my, you know, iPhone but the stress of missing one of those documents when you're in air, I, mm -hmm. I would be checking my bag every five minutes, and then you're like, uh-oh, did it fall out when I last put my hand in there? That's got to be stressful. It is stressful, and it's not like you can show up in immigration and be like, hey, Google me. <laughs> I, I have a legit reason to be here. They'll be like, no, why don't you Google us on your flight back home? <laughs> uh, so, so no, you know, you got to have your documents in place. Now, what about that flight heading back home when you thought, I might end up in jail? How? What was that flight like? Did You you probably couldn't sleep. You probably couldn't eat. I just got drunk. I'm just going to be honest. Uh, like, uh, And I had this, you know, th the show that I'm doing is about a lovely conversation with an air hostess on Air India who just kind of said, I love the video and I'm going to take care of you because this might be your last flight. So she just got me drunk on gin and uh, gave me a little bit of liquid courage. And the narrative of the show that I'm doing is, is a story of a conversation with her. So, clue me in. Essentially, you're making jokes about India. They don't like it. You're labeled as a terrorist against that country, and then they want to jail you for that? Yeah, I had seven criminal complaints filed against me. I was charged with sedition, etc. And it all worked out, you know, so everything was fine. It was just sort of fringe elements who were filing those cases. But in retrospect, it ended up being one of the most positive things that ever happened because one was able to kind of touch a chord with people. And it's, it's coming right back to what I said. It's about that personal connection with people. One was able to forge something where we both said the thing that we were thinking but never said and therefore valued each other. But now is there a more distinctive line in the sand of what you shouldn't cross or have you pushed that line? You're like, I can say these things because people need to hear these things and people are thinking these things. I don't think about it so much. I'm going to be honest, man. Like, I'm just worried about making you laugh, you know, and the rest of it will come secondary. I'm, I, I'm not a fan of sort of message comedians. I'm not a fan of, you know, uh, trying to drive a point down your throat. I'm just trying to make you laugh. And if some of my conscience falls onto the page, then that's fine. I'll never deny that. But the thing I'm worried about is, is the joke tight enough? Is there economy of words? Is there a nice tag to the joke? Are people laughing? Those are the things I like to busy myself with. Give me maybe some of your top street foods, everything from a hot dog cart in the U.S. to, I mean, India's got some of the most iconic street food ever, a level the U.S. has never even seen. What are your go-tos in different countries? And you said you went over to 20 different countries recently. What do you have to get when you're flying around? All right, let's do this. So London would be a salt beef sandwich, like a proper British salt beef sandwich or like a pub pie. I'd love like a, a chicken and mushroom or like a steak and egg pie. If you're in Dubai, I like the, the hummus with lamb in it because you just don't get a lot of that over here. 
If you're in South Africa or Africa, there's something called suya, which is skewered meat barbecued on the beach with a fire. I love just sort of uh, Shanghai street food, which is just amazing. And, and, you know, a lot is just like Korean barbecue is, is good stuff as well. And then I kind of got into katsu, uh, which a lot of people, you know, in Europe are getting into. But, you know, I, I don't find a lot of good katsu places over here. Is that Japanese? And then with India, I, yeah. And, and then I just kind of like rolls from India. So like a kati roll, you know, like a, a nice wrap with like chicken tikkas or katis inside. As a world traveler, you, I'm surely you've run to a situation where you had something that wasn't maybe prepared the best or just didn't agree with you. Greek food. I think I just overdid it. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people who I tend to stay relatively healthy. And then when I'm shooting a special or I'm shooting a movie, I'm typically intermittent fasting. And then the day the shoot is done, I just overdo it. And the next morning I give birth basically, is is how this works. So I think when I wrapped my last shoot, which was earlier this year, then I went out for Greek food and just kind of overdid the desserts and everything. And then I was just out for a while. What benefits then have you taken from the intermittent fast? And is that something you're still doing? Or do you do it right yeah. before a show? Or is it a, a weekly routine for you? It's just something that I do to cut before a shoot. So right now I'm shooting the Netflix special on Friday. So I've been intermittent fasting for about four weeks. And, you know, I take a break day in between. I stay healthy, but I, I eat for eight hours a day and then I don't eat. So it's just good to keep you healthy and it keeps your energy levels up. North India, South India, which has the best food? They're two very different places. And I'm a North Indian, so I'm going to say North India because it's, you know, it's a lot more meat. It's a lot more sort of, uh, it's spicier, richer food. But South India definitely has the better designed food and the healthier food. Now, there is here in Boise a place called the Bombay Grill probably ought to check it out is how is american indian food is it is it a joke or is it pretty close um i think it's american indian food <laughs> yeah 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 so it's got the but idea yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. when you're writing a stand-up special for say something like wanted when you sit down and you're by yourself and you're writing that out how does that differ when you're doing a speech for college graduates because you still got to have jokes in there but you're talking to very different people and you want two very different effects. But also, they still got to laugh. So it can't just be the same show, right? You can't just get up and do your routine to college graduates. No, I, you know, I, I think you have to treat a, a comedy special like a piece of cinema. And it has to have the pace of a movie and the dynamics of a movie. It's got to have lulls and it's got to have like one or two acts in it. And then sort of a narrative and it's got to tie together at the end. And with college graduates, you just kind of want to put yourself second and put them first. So... You know, think about everything that they might be worried about and try and address that. That's kind of how I approached my graduation speech when I, when I gave it at Knox, the convocation speech. So, you know, I was just like, what are they probably worried about? And what was I worried about at this moment in time? And let me put them first. So completely different writing experiences, I would say. You're born in India. You live in India now. You went to college in Africa, also in America. So right there, that's a minimum of three languages. But I don't even know how many languages India has. It's got to be a couple of hundred. So how many languages yeah. can you get by on the street ordering food in? Like, you got to have a handful of them. No, I, I, you know, I, I speak Hindi and English, so I can get by in that sense. But I can tell you to do horrible things to your mother in about 10 different <laughs> That was my next question. Which one is the most fun to swear in? Like, that's the first thing you got to learn. Oh, man, Hindi. Hindi is the best language to swear in. It's, uh, it's just nuanced and sweet and biting and cruel all at the same time. Can you give me a couple of words? In English, you, you tell people to do things to their mother. We don't go for mothers in India. We just do sisters. So first thing, we go after your sister. That's one. And then it's, it's always attached to, like, food. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it'll be like, you plate of stupid or, you, you know, you bucket of something. We bring like utensils and all of that stuff. It's nuanced cutting. Can you give me a couple in Hindi, a couple of swear words or put downs? Okay, so it's called Chutia Kathali, which is just a plate full of fucks. You're a plate full of fucks, <laughs> which I love. I love <laughs> How do you say it again? Chutia Kathali. <laughs> I do like it. I like the, the creativeness yeah. and the, uh, the good put downs. Yeah. The Netflix show coming in December, is that filmed and done? Is that in production now or is it just kind of on hold waiting? It's getting filmed in 48 hours. Uh, I will have filmed it by the time I come to you. Where are you filming it at then? Uh, we're doing it at the Skirball Center in New York City at NYU. So you're intermittently fasting right now. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm going to eat at 12 o'clock. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Veer Das coming to Boise, Idaho. I assume, is this your first time in Idaho? Yeah, man, for sure. 
October 13th, Egyptian Theater, Veer Das. Can't wait to see you in Boise here in October. Good luck at your show. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Cheers.